Good morning. To begin this morning, I want to ask you, have you ever had to tackle something in your life that felt utterly and completely impossible? So just pause for a moment. Think to yourself or maybe write down in your mini mag something in your life that has, you know, come before you that you've had to tackle that just felt over your head, completely impossible. And while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and answer the question. I came up with it, so I'll try to tackle the answer. And there are actually two things that came to mind for me. The first, funny enough, is giving birth. Um, I, my husband and I, Steve, we have three daughters. We have Grace, who's 14, Eva's 12, and Beth, who just turned seven. And, you know, I'm one of these people that I loved being pregnant. I really had, you know, smooth pregnancies, no complications, amazing. But all that changed when it came time to actually deliver these precious kids into the world. And, you know, I just thought every single time in childbirth, I was going to die. Every time. You can ask my husband. He'll tell you. I had horrendously long labors, complications, crazy, crazy birth stories. And, yeah, I just thought I was going to die. It felt impossible. Um, the second thing that came to mind for me was agreeing last April to preach here at Southridge for the first time. And that was just a really daunting thing for me to agree to and just felt huge and even impossible. But here's the thing. Both of these experiences, they didn't kill me. Um, I lived to tell and I learned a ton and I discovered that what I thought was impossible turned out not to be. Now, earlier this year, we spent many years studying the Lord's Prayer as a community in a fresh way, in a bite-sized way, in a piece-by-piece kind of way. And I know from my experience and from talking to many of you that that series was extremely significant. The Lord's Prayer has become so much more than something we recite, um, like I did in grade school. It's become a way of life that we want to live. And over the last four weeks, we've been journeying on a series called Life Revolution, In these weeks, we've been learning about how to live our lives and base them around the Lord's Prayer. We've talked about storing up treasures in heaven. We've talked about not worrying, not judging, and not compromising our integrity. Pretty big topics. And if you're anything like me, you struggle with all these areas of life. And maybe by this point, you're feeling totally overwhelmed Um, you might be feeling incredibly aware that this kingdom way of life is impossible to live. And if you're feeling that way, you're absolutely right. You're totally correct. Because on our own strength and with our own resources, it is nothing short of impossible. So the question that we want to ask this morning is, how do we do it? And funny enough, that's the question that Jesus intended us to answer in his next section of this very sermon. So read with me, look with me in Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So basically in this passage, Jesus is saying three things. First of all, he's saying, when things feel impossible, go to God. The second thing he's saying is, continue to go to God. And the third thing he's saying is go to God in prayer. Because from Jesus's perspective, a life of prayerful reliance is central to living out the kingdom life. Jesus knows this and he invites us to ask, to seek, and to knock. The answer to living out this way of life is through ongoing reliance. And the really, really, really good news of this morning is that there is a way we can live out the Lord's prayer. There's a way that we can live out a storing up treasures in heaven, not worrying, not judging, not throwing it all away kind of life. And that is through simply relying on Christ. If you've been around Southridge for any time, you'll know that what makes us unique as a church is the way in which we are calling each other to live out our faith in a way that is 24-7, in a way that is beyond Sunday mornings, We are asking God as a community to make us all in kingdom kingdom loving, Christ centered, fully devoted kind of people. And a lifestyle of reliance on God is essential to equipping, enabling, and empowering us to be those kind of people and to allow God to do in us and through us more than we could ever ask or imagine. 
The kingdom life is completely impossible on our own and completely possible with God because with God, all things are possible. The thing is, the older I get and the more life experience I have, the more acutely aware I am of my own need, my sin, and my brokenness. And I can either choose to run to God or to handle things on my own. And more and more, I am choosing and longing to be the kind of person who runs to God and clings to God and relies on God. I so want to be a person of reliance and dependency because I do make a mess of things when I rely on myself. And you and I can only be the kind of person we read about in the Sermon on the Mount through ongoing reliance on Christ. And Jesus is inviting us to be those very people. And the sooner we come to the sorry, the sooner we come to the end of ourselves, the better. Here's what we read in Matthew 5 3. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God in his rule. We're all in different places, we're all in different journeys. And, you know, some of us are learning reliance on God in fresh ways through um, health challenges or relationship challenges, through financial challenges, through mistakes we've made or hurts that we've been dealt. And life is so often not easy. In fact, life can be very, very difficult. And at the same time, I am learning that to be in a place of reliance is actually a gift. It can be a sweet spot. It's where you and I are stretched, and it's where God does some of of his deepest and most transformative work, if we'll let him. It actually can be a beautiful place to be. So these days, I'm longing to be the kind of person that embraces a life of reliance. In John 15, 5 to 7, we read this. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourself at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. I love that part where John says, make yourself at home with me and my words at home in you. The NIV translation reads it this way in John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Prayer keeps us connected to the very life of Christ. The essence of Christianity is Christ in us, Christ in you, Christ in me. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. And so here's what that means practically. Because it's one thing to talk about it, but what really counts is the practical. So let's talk about what that means practically. First of all, we humble ourselves and we embrace the very idea of reliance. We come to a place where we realize and we acknowledge that reliance isn't a sign of weakness. Um, It's how you and I were always created to live. It's the place where we become the best possible version of ourselves. To live in a spirit of continuous, ongoing, daily reliance on God, we must embrace and choose surrender. Because a life of reliance and dependency, it's not about trying harder, it's not about attending more programs or checking off a to-do list or acquiring rules to follow. It's about surrender. It's about moment by moment, daily surrender. Um, I'm a country music fan, and you know I think Carrie Underwood right now, right? The whole idea of letting Jesus take the wheel. So that's the idea of surrender. Um, To use a New Testament phrase, we die to ourselves. We allow God to be God. We let him have his rightful place in our lives. We allow him to live in us and through us. Embracing, Embracing surrender puts us in a posture where we take our fists that are clenched and we open them wide. It's a scary place to be, And yet, it's a beautiful and free place to be. And practically speaking, here's what surrender means. It means that we feel vulnerable. It means that we let go of the need to control. It means that we allow love to rule our lives. Not greed, not worry, not fear, not judgment, but love. It means that we choose to trust. We receive and extend forgiveness and grace. We hold our possessions loosely 
We withhold judgment on others. We acknowledge that our lives are not our own. It's about having a heart toward God that is undivided and it's praying your will be done, not mine. Your will be done, your kingdom come. Because a life of surrender is not about me. It's about orienting myself around God and the stuff that he cares about. Because my life and your life is a part of a much, much bigger story. Surrender is a big part of allowing God to write our story. Knowing that my story and your story weaves together in the greater, bigger story that God is writing. Surrender means we trust his timing and we acknowledge the fact that we don't know the big picture, we don't know what's best. Surrender means we embrace the mystery that is a part of prayer. Because surrender and trust go together hands in hands. And secondly, don't underestimate the importance of small steps. It kind of made me think about uh, right now, I'm taking a Pilates class online and um, this is a really manageable class. It's 10 minutes a day. And I love, love, love the philosophy behind this class. The philosophy is about grace and not guilt. Um, you know, recognizing that we're already hard enough on ourselves and guilt is really not productive. And um, the thinking behind this online Pilates class is that something, you know, 10 minutes a day is better than nothing. And I couldn't help but think that that kind of relates to our prayer lives as well, our, our lives of building reliance on God. And I thought, you know, let's be people that choose um, grace over guilt and over comparison. And let's recognize that this is a lifelong journey. You know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. We are wanting to build a lifestyle of relating to God, so we keep at it. And every day is a fresh beginning. It's not a one-time thing. So keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And these are present tense verbs. This means we keep going to God. The New Testament encourages us to keep in step with his spirit. And that very language um, indicates that it's a walk. It's a journey. It's a daily choice. It's one foot in front of the other. Um, Matthew 6, 8 says, you know, to walk with God humbly. And the more that we choose to pray and to go to God as a first response, the more that we develop that muscle, the more that prayer and reliance will become our default. And it doesn't happen by accident, which of course is true with any relationship. It requires intentionality because our natural tendency is to drift. So it's impossible, in summary, it's impossible to live out the Lord's prayer on our own. The sooner we come to the end of ourselves, the better God is inviting us to rely on him through prayer and prayer keeps us connected to the life of Christ. The only way to be kingdom men and women is to ask, seek, and knock again and again and again. So the obvious question at this point is, will God deliver? Will he do it? Can we trust him? Will he come through for us? And Jesus himself raises and addresses this very doubt. He seems to know that we would feel that way, and he invites us to ask this very question. In Matthew 7, 9 to 11, here's what we read. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God wants us to pray for daily provision. He wants us to pray for his will to be done, his kingdom to come, forgiveness, protection from temptation, deliverance from evil. And he wants to equip us and empower us to live out the very lifestyle we're praying about. In Luke's version of this very same passage, Luke 9, 13, it reads, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He will always give us the Holy Spirit when we ask, always. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate way in which God delivers. It's impossible, absolutely impossible to live the Christian life apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead to equip and empower you and I to live out the kind of lifestyle that we have been studying through the Sermon on the Mount. The Holy Spirit is the absolute key to living out the Lord's prayer in our day-to-day -day lives. Without him, it is impossible. 
For those of us who need permission to ask, God is inviting us to ask. God is the one who initiates prayer. He's the initiator of relationship with you and with me. He has searched us out. And as Jeff Martins reminded us a few weeks ago, we are the treasure that he is searching for. We are the treasure that he is pursuing. He's invited us to respond to that invitation and to keep on responding. Just like a good parent wants to be included and asked, God is inviting us to ask, seek, and knock. I love how we read this very same passage in the message. It reads this, don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be even better? Jesus is inviting us to be bold and direct. Directness is a sign of comfort and it's a sign of trust. You know, I think about my kids. My kids don't beat around the bush when they're hungry. They ask for a snack or they just go in the fridge and take one. They feel, um, yeah, they feel comfortable, sometimes too comfortable. And God wants us to behave like the kids that we are. He doesn't want us to play games. He wants us to know and understand his heart. He's not a God who tricks us or looks to scare us. He's a perfect father whose heart is good, reliable, and faithful. Jesus is also inviting us to pray audacious prayers, prayers that only he can answer. I call these only God prayers. These are the prayers that unless God answers, they will never happen. These are the kind of prayers that excite me because these are the kind of prayers that change us and change the world as we partner with God in this adventure. And it all begins with us behaving as God's kids and praying only God prayers. Um, If you and I were to have had coffee at some point in the last, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, it's highly possible that I would have brought up a book that has been really significant really significant to me. Um, I probably would have brought it up and insisted that you go out and buy it. And it is a book by Brene Brown. I brought it along with me. Um, It's called Daring Greatly, How the Courage to be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, Love, Parent, and Lead. And, you know, my friends and my family, I have like probably driven them crazy talking about this book over the last 12 to 18 months because it's been really significant for me. And if you were at the Leadership Summit last uh, summer, you would have heard Brene Brown speak, and she was fantastic. And she is actually, or we are actually going to show that very talk from the Leadership Summit 2013 as a part of our It Takes a Village series here at Southridge in in July. So you will not want to miss that. It's going to be awesome. And yeah, Daring Greatly is one of my all-time favorite books. It's shaped me in huge ways as a wife, as a mother, a friend, a sister, a leader. And in this book, there's all kinds of, you know, just amazing wisdom. But she writes this one chapter that really stuck with me. And the entire chapter is about scarcity. Um, She talks about how we're a culture of scarcity. And in that chapter, she quotes author and global activist Lynn Twist with these words. For me and for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, I didn't get enough sleep. The next one is, I don't have enough time. Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and the days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. We live in a culture of scarcity, and often you and I live lives of scarcity. We believe we aren't good enough, perfect enough, thin enough, smart enough, certain enough, and so on. And sometimes I think it's easy to think of God as scarce as well. I know I used to think this for so many years. Um, I didn't realize I thought this, but I've come to realize that for many years, I thought that God was holding out on me. And 
this could not be further from the truth because God is not like us. He is not a God of scarcity. In fact, scripture uses words like lavish, unconditional, unfailing, steadfast, generous, rich, strong, and powerful to describe God's love. His heart is good. His love never fails. His resources never run dry. We can trust his heart because he is nothing like us. In fact, we read in Isaiah 40, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. This is the God we are praying to, a God who is for us, a God who gives good gifts. James 1.17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In, in my family, my husband Steve, he is the king of the budget. Um, he is, you know, he's the one who is gifted to keep our family on track financially. And it's fantastic because those are his strengths and they are not my strengths. If it was up to me, we'd probably be bankrupt. So he's fantastic at that. And, um, you know, just to give you an example, he loves to go through like the flyers and find out what's on sale at the grocery store. He does the grocery shopping, loves to get deals, loves to save money. Super helpful. Amazing. And he's ridiculously disciplined when it comes to uh, saving and spending money. And he's responsible when it comes to planning for the future. And he's just all around, in the best possible way, frugal. It's a really, really good thing. And the fascinating thing about Steve is that he is like this the majority of the time and the majority of the year, except for on family vacations. Um, on family vacations... Basically, all that goes out the window, and the tuck shop, the camp store, the gift shop, whatever happens to be that place, wherever we are, it becomes king. And the supply is endless, and it doesn't run dry, and our kids, you know, they just have unlimited amounts of pop, and chips, and slushies, and licorice, and nerds, and ring pops, and push pops, and everything. It's over the top and completely ridiculous. And as a mom, it actually drives me crazy because of, you know, the amount of food coloring, red food coloring, and the amount of sugar. And it's so drastically different, different from the way we live our lives the rest of the year. It, yeah, it's just purely ridiculous. And I was thinking about that story and thinking about this talk, and it kind of made me think, you know, if Steve, as a human parent, knows how to just love and lavish and bless our kids like that on family vacation, um, how much more our Heavenly Father loves to give you and I good gifts. And I think God is like Steve on vacation times a million. Uh, God is good all the time, not just on vacations, all the time. And we can have confidence that not only does he know how to give us good gifts, but that he wants to. So keep on asking for whatever it is that you are in need of. If it's reconciliation or healing or wisdom or direction, if it's grace, if it's strength, keep asking. Pray through um, the requests of the Lord's Prayer. And ultimately, keep asking for more of his Holy Spirit. And secondly, ask God to show you how much you need him, because he will. God invites us to ask. He wants us to behave as the kids that we are, and he promises to answer us in goodness. Now, with today being Father's Day and all, I've been kind of sentimental, and thinking about the ways that dads I know, um, you know, lavish and bless their kids and give them good and generous gifts. And I've thought about lots of examples. Here's a few that have come to mind. I think about dads who get up while it's still dark outside and take their kids to sports practices. I think about dads who spend countless hours at the hospital with their kids while they're sick or recovering. Dads who overflow in patience. Um, 
you know, whether it's because their baby is up sick through the night or whether it's patients because they're teaching their six-year-old how to ride a bike for the first time. Um, and maybe they're teaching that same kid at the age of 16 how to drive a car and just the patience that goes along with that. I think about dads who are courageous, courageous enough to get the help they need to overcome addiction and be the best possible dad they can be. I think about dads who search high and low for the perfect gift. You know, my dad does this, and I love that. Um, He will search high and low for the perfect gift for a birthday or graduation or wedding or special occasion, just the thoughtfulness that goes into that. I think about dads who coach their kids' teams. Dads who take time out of their busy schedule to invest one-on-one time with their kids. Dads who listen well. Dads who instill in their kids a love for justice, for music, for art, for science, for education, and so on. I think about dads who have fun with their kids, who laugh and wrestle and take risks and live a life of adventure. I think about dads who offer and extend forgiveness and second chances. I think about dads who say that I'm sorry and model humility. Dads who fight for a relationship with their kids when they're young, when they're teens, when they're adults. I think about dads who live generously and sacrificially, recognizing it's not about them. Dads who live a legacy that goes on to future generations. Dads who pray for their kids consistently. I think about my migrant worker friends that spend over half the year working here in Canada to send their children through college or university and provide a better way of life for future generations. I think about these examples and they are amazing. And as good as they are, none of them even come close to the good, good heart of our God. If we know how to give good gifts, imagine how much more our Father in heaven will give good gifts to those of us who ask. Knowing and believing that God is the giver of good gifts, let's keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Let's choose to rely on God because without him, the kingdom life is impossible. Through reliance on Christ, we can become the Lord's Prayer kind of people that we have read about and studied about. We can become men and women who ask, seek, and knock, the very kind of people who change the world with our lives and with our prayers. I so want to be someone who is deeply committed to praying the Lord's Prayer, and I want to be someone who is deeply committed to living it. As I close this morning, we want to give all of us the opportunity to do both, to pray and to live it. In just a minute, a local leader at each of our locations is going to guide us through this time of prayer as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us in a way that invites us to connect our whole lives to the Lord's Prayer. It's a moment to pray this prayer with your whole heart, Asking God to empower you to live it with your whole life. As they lead us, I invite you to enter into the spirit of Jesus' prayer and invite him to enter into your experience of it that we might become people who not only pray as Jesus taught us to pray, but live as Jesus taught us to live. Let's pray together.